lost I would have put about a hundred dollars in happy bucks because they're anything anything that makes a mother happier than talking about her children. So I am delighted to introduce today's program, which happens to be Christopher Kirby Stark, uh, otherwise known as Chris Stark, uh, my second son, and Jim Stark's second son as well. Chris was born in Lewiston, Maine, but uh, he moved to Columbus when he was four years old. So he grew up here in Columbus, went to Columbus North, ran cross country with Coach Wayne High School. Uh, went to Hanover College and got a BA in business. Let's say for Hanover, thank you, brother. As a matter of fact, Chris's older, older son, Austin, is a freshman there right now. So yay, Hanover. Uh, Chris started <coughs> his professional career when he graduated from Hanover 91 with Urban Union Bank. He was a commercial lender. He uh, later worked for Union Federal Savings Bank and with Midwest Bankers Group in Indianapolis. In 2003, Chris started his own company, Stark Capital Solutions, Inc. And I was really curious to have him send me information because I've never understood exactly what he did. It's a national firm and it has two focuses. It provides investment banking services to the communication tower and outdoor advertising industries. And secondly, is a venture capital company using a combination of its own capital and that of investment partners, many of whom I think he got to know in his banking time. Uh, he's been providing financial services to outdoor advertising and communication tower companies since 1995, and here's where the mother brags. In that time, he's closed over 400 transactions, creating over $350 million in value. So when I want to know about numbers and business numbers, I always go to Chris. Hobbies are running, mountain biking, road biking, camping, golfing, paddleboarding, and boating. Uh, in terms of volunteering, he goes down and speaks several times a year at Hanover Business Scholars Program. Uh, he also speaks at industry trade shows and conventions. Uh, member of Lima Chi Alpha Chapter Board at Hanover. Uh, helps at a homeless shelter. He's been involved in junior achievement. He's been a soccer coach, a basketball coach, involved with an entrepreneurial organization, married to his college sweetheart, Anne. They have three children. And his first car, which came to him after being thoroughly used by my older sister's children, was the 1976 bicentennial Chevy Chevette. So I present to you now Chris Stark, who's going to talk to you about his infamous death Right. Chris. Okay, so this is not my first time speaking to this very Rotary Club. This picture was taken 30, over 30 years ago with my dad sitting over here um, when he and I did another athletic adventure and uh, we ran across the state of Florida as my sophomore year in high school. And so we had the opportunity to come and speak. Dad was involved in the Rotary Pro program at the time, so we had a chance to speak um, about our adventure. And anyone who's run a marathon or done anything they get trained hard for that's athletic in nature or knows somebody who has, probably know that somewhere near the end of that event, you always say to yourself, I'm never gonna do this again. And you tell the people around you, you're never gonna do it again. But usually within a day or two of the pain kind of going away, you think, well, I'll probably do that again. Well, that run with Dad, I will never go again. And I knew from the time we finished that we would never do that again. I think that would occur. So what I think is kind of ironic, 30 years later, is I'm going to talk to you about another adventure, the only other adventure I've done that I can say 100%, I will never, ever do again. <laughs> and so I hope you enjoy uh, hearing about it, but I also, for my sake, hope that I never do another one of these things to come down and talk to you guys about. So what did I do? So I did um, the Death Ride, it's called the Death Ride Tour of the California Alps. So just what this is, is as it says on their logo, is 15,000 feet of climbing. We'll talk a little bit about perspective on how much that is. 130 miles or 129 miles is five mountains that you pass um, in one single day. This is, um, you're not gonna be able to see the detail of this, but you get perspective of what it looks like. So, uh, so this is, basically a, a graphic of the altitude. Um, so you got pass one, pass two, pass three, pass four, pass five. 
and then the miles along the bottom. And um, what's hard to understand, and it was hard for me to get my arms around, is you actually only go and going up and down three mountains. So this first climb is up one side of the mountain, down the other side of it, then you go back up the side, this side, that you just came down, and then back down the first side you came up, and then you start your second mountain. And then the third one, you just go up and come back down, you don't go down the other side. So, um, why did I do this? What was I thinking? Um, well, I had, uh, three years before, um, as mom had said, I ran cross country and I continued to run marathons and do other endurance um, running, uh, primarily after college. Um, but I blinked and got old and the knees were getting shot. And so um, I started to think about biking. And about three years ago, a friend of mine um, who knew I was thinking of that said, hey, you gotta do this ride with me in Colorado. And so I bought a bike and trained hard for it. And it was basically it's seven days. There's a mountain every day, 60 to 80 miles or so. Um, most of the mountains were 10 to 11,000 feet. And trained hard for that, did it, and had a ball. And found that I loved the climbing part of it. I liked the fact that it was slower, that you could see the scenery. I found that I was good. My body was suited for that well. I had no problem with the altitude. And so ever since I did that ride, I thought, you know, I need to find another adventure like this that I can train for that includes climbing and altitude. And so the death ride popped up. Every time I typed in, you know, climbing ride, hard climbing ride, it tops, pops in as the top five hardest in the country. So I talked to the three guys, or the two guys, um, that had invited me out to the Colorado ride, and I said, hey, let's do this death ride. So we all signed up. Later, these guys bail about two months after we signed up on it. As they started reading more about it, they're like, there's no way we're into this thing. So even though they got me the courage to sign up, they bailed and I ended up training for this thing solo. So here's kind of how I uh, train for it. You're not going to be able to read all the detail, but I kind of explain it. So in Indiana, you can't really ride much in January, February. So March is about as early as you can get out on a road bike and safely be able to ride. And so you're kind of starting from scratch in terms of a base of endurance. I still run some and, and do other cross training, but biking wise, um, kind of starting from scratch. And so as I researched this ride, um, there wasn't a ton of information on it, but what they all said, they all said three things that you had to prepare for three things. One is you have to be prepared to be on a bike for 13 to 14 hours. So you need to train, you know, you're sitting on a little hard seat, bent over, you know, neck straining. And so it's not a comfortable position unless you're really, and it's not comfortable when you're used to it, but you gotta train your body to get used to that. So part of the training is just doing long rides, not necessarily miles, but just being on your bike a long time. Secondly, you gotta get used to climbing because that's what you're gonna be doing most of the time. You know, slow up the hills and flying down the other side. So most of the day is spent climbing. So you gotta put in a lot of uh, elevation gain is what they call it. So that's just feet of climbing. And then third, um, they talk about nutrition. Because you're gonna be on the bike for so long, and you hear this when they talk about the Tour de France, how many calories the riders have to consume just to be able to sustain the energy level. And that's hard to do uh, because you can't carry that much stuff with you. And so part of the training talked about figuring out how your body reacts and, and what kind of nutrition you need. It won't make you sick, but will give you the energy you need. So, um, so I kind of, under this monthly goals, came up with a plan. And they all said if you could do at least two 100-mile rides, at least two rides where you climb 10,000 feet in elevation, and then figure out your nutrition, then you should be good to go. You should be able to do the ride. So I basically, my, my goals um, here basically had me building up to where I could do these you know, longer rides and, and figure out my nutrition and get the, the 100 miles in. So an example of one of my rides, um, and Dad was kind of involved in this. I decided, you know, to find hills in Indiana. Um, most bikers in Indiana know have heard of the Hilly Hundred, which is probably the hilliest ride you could do in Indiana. It's a two-day event, usually roughly 50 miles one day, 50 miles the next day. So I found whatever year the 46th annual one was, they had a decent map online. So they had the map of the route, and I decided I'd do that in one day. I built up to where I needed to do 100 mile a day. So I thought, okay, I'll just do the Hilly Hundred instead of Saturday and Sunday. I'll just do it all in one day. And I picked a really hot day, it was 95, 96 degrees, heat index over 100. And I basically picked the map. What's interesting when you're riding these rides, I didn't know any of these roads. I'm not from Bloomington or that whole area. Um, and there are, uh, you won't be able to read that, but there's 48 turns, basically 48 places you gotta turn in the middle of nowhere, in the country, and there's nothing that's gonna be marked because that's not the only 100 course anymore, it just was in the 46th annual one. 
So I basically printed that out and had it taped to my bike, and I tell me, could tell me how many miles I was on a certain road before I needed to look for the next road and turn. Well, long story short, on that ride, it worked great until I met Dad, and we had a good lunch, and then I got back on the bike, and somewhere along the line, I missed a turn. People steal street signs all the time, for whatever reason, it must be a great thing to hang in your, in your room. And so you're kind of guessing, and I got turned around, and um, got completely lost, missed my water stop, is my son's graduated from, from high school that day, so I'm getting calls from my wife, you know, are you gonna make it, are you gonna make it? And I don't know where I am, I'm in the middle of nowhere. And what's interesting about that, the reason I tell it is because, and I know this because I've run my entire life and done endur endurance events, and uh, Coach Weinheimer, still the coach of the cross country team here, would beat into our head that adrenaline that you feel be before a race, that nervousness, put it to positive use because that's actually a chemical that's producing energy in your body to make you go faster and longer and harder. But if you think of it as negative and it makes you worried, then it works the opposite. It steals your energy from your body. And so that day, I was feeling great through 50 miles, about 60 miles I got lost. I got that panic that I was gonna be late and that I wasn't gonna get water. I immediately crashed and burned. I had no energy. And so my lesson at the end of that training ride was I gotta remember to control that, you know, that end, the mental energy, and it gotta stay positive. You can't let that, that take you down. In my next ride, I did another, a different year's Hilly 100. I had two flat tires, and you only carry, I only carried two spare tubes, two CO2 cartridges to fix it. Um, so things were going not very well, but I remember the lesson learned in that, and I'm like, just stay positive, It'll, you know, it's gonna work out, and I was able to kind of fight through it and keep my energy up. And so that was part of the whole purpose of these trainings, to figure this stuff up, remind yourself how important these things are. So this, um, this is a picture from my phone, um, it's an iPhone, and there's an application called Strava, where you can basically turn it on when you start a ride, and it tells you how far you've gone. And, uh, and so this was that ride I showed you the map of. So you can see it was 100 miles, I gained 4,900 feet of elevation, it took me almost seven hours, 4,500 calories, <laughs> so tons of calories. But the reason I'm showing you this is because this was kind of the beginning of me realizing this is gonna be a really hard ride to train for in, in Indiana. Remember, I was supposed to do a 100 mile ride with 10,000 feet of elevation gain. I just did both days of the Hilly 100, the hardest hill ride in Indiana, and I only got 4,900 feet of elevation gain. I went into Brown County State Park and rode 100 miles, and if you've seen the hills in there, they're super steep and fairly long. Same thing, less than 5,000 feet of elevation gain in 100 miles, seven hours. So I just conceded that I wasn't gonna get a 10,000 mile climb in living in Indiana unless I could ride 200 miles, which I couldn't do. And so I thought, well, they're steeper. Um, we got headwind here is what everybody tells you, and that's like climbing hills, so I'm just gonna trust that my training is gonna work out. So before I go out to, uh, this ride is in uh, basically just south of Lake Tahoe in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Well, we get an email literally two weeks out. I'm done with all my training, getting ready to go, and it says, we're not sure we're gonna have the ride. We got forest fires that are literally burning over the road that you're gonna be riding on, and the towns are closed, you can't get any kind of um, support back in there. This is actually a picture of that fire uh, that was burning. That's one of the roads we ended up riding on. Well, luckily they got it under control about four or five days before I was supposed to fly out. And so the ride was on and I was good to go. So I prepared, everybody said it was gonna be hot. So I prepared for it to be you know, very hot. I didn't take a lot of cold weather clothes. I show up in uh, Lake Tahoe and that's snow. <laughs> that's at the house I'm staying at. It was covered, and I was supposed to, part of my training, um, I decided to mimic exactly what I did in Colorado as far as altitude, getting adjusted to altitude, which is a big problem coming from Indiana, being at the sea level, basically, and going up, and, and Lake Tahoe is like Denver, where I stayed for the Colorado ride, basically a mile high, it's 50, I think it's 5,800 feet above sea level. So my plan was that day to go for a ride, which is what I'd done, is a Wednesday. Uh, the official death ride was on Saturday get in just an easy ride, which I knew was gonna feel terrible because it did in Colorado, you just get used to the altitude. But there was snow, so I basically just walked up and down the stairs for about a half hour, got out of breath, and thought, okay, that's gotta be about the same. <laughs> so, then, so then the second day, it, it, was, it was a little better, and, um, and I was able to climb um, to the top of this. This was about a 2,000 foot, um, which again, it was 2,000 feet, is about 15 miles up this mountain, or 10 miles up this mountain, so the Hilly 100, if you think about this, one day at the Hilly 100 is about 2,500 feet of elevation climb. This one 10 mile stretch is basically that, all just in one stretch. That's the difference between mountains and what we have here in Indiana. But I got up to the top of it, beautiful view of Lake Tahoe, and I felt great. 
Um, the day before, I felt so winded, you know, just walking up down the stairs. But this day, I climbed up, legs felt strong. I thought, okay, good, the training worked out. I'm, I'm altitude acclimated. I'll take Friday off and be ready to go Saturday. So the day, day after this, I went and registered for the, or got my packet for the ride. So this is the kind of their logo, the Death Ride logo. It's a skeleton, it's on everything. And uh, so they had a little skeleton set up there. And so I'm standing in line, um, if, you've ever, if you've ever run road races and you go pick up your packet, you know how you get to talk to the fellow runners or bikers? And so everybody's standing around and, and, and somebody asked me, you know, so where are you from? And I'm like, Indiana. I'm like, what are you doing here? I'm like, well, I'm out here to do the ride. Like, no, really, you came out here just to do the ride from Indiana? I'm like, yeah. So they nudge their friend, this guy's from Indiana, he's going to do this ride. And so people got talking about it, and they're, they're looking at my pack to see if I'm really from Indiana. I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, don't people come from all over the place to do this? And, uh, and it started to sink in. Like, everybody seems so surprised I'm from Indiana. But I, you know, again, back to my Colorado, right? I'm like, well, I had no problems with the mountains. I don't know what, you know, they, they must just not know you can train for this thing in Indiana. Foreshadowing, they do. So then my brother, Eric, my older brother, um, happened to be at a conference in um, Oregon at the same time. So he popped over to be either to identify my body if I didn't make it, <laughs> or, to, or to drink a beer with me in celebration if I did. So this is a picture of us out of Lake Tahoe. Um, and then I put together, um, kind of like what I did on that you know, Hill 100 ride, I put together a little chart that I had on my bike um, that I could see because this particular ride, the death ride, has cutoff times. So if you don't make it up, the passes by a certain time, they kick you off the course. And so I wanted to make sure I kind of had an idea of goal time that had some cushion built in. So um, part of what I did was I figured out what speed I would ride up these mountains, and I factored that in, and I knew how fast I'd go down the other side, I knew how long I'd stop for my, uh, for my breaks. And so I built this in, and that had me finishing at the top, whoop, you can see at the uh, top of Carson at five o'clock, and the cutoff time was uh, 8.30, so I had me a three and a half hour cushion basically um, in case I needed it. So um, got my bike ready. This is the bike that I have had for the whole time I've been riding. It's a um, track for anybody who's a biker. It's a Trek Badone 4.6, which is carbon fiber. The thing, you know, the last bike I had before this was the Schwinn Varsity that weighed probably 150 pounds <laughs> and had a banana seat. And this thing weighs, I think it's, I think it's 18 pounds. You can literally look it up with two fingers. They're just, they weigh nothing. I mean, you get on and it's just your body, basically. And so you see in the, uh, in the back, there's a little saddle. That's where you put your food. So that's where I put all the calories that I was going to eat. And they make all kinds of crazy energy, goo and bars and stuff. So it's pretty easy to get the energy in once you find something that tastes good to you and you can tolerate. Um, I take two water bottles. They're not in there right now. But I usually go through two water bottles about every hour, hour and a half, and that keeps you hydrated. You put stuff in that that um, helps your electrolytes stay high. So I was ready to go. My plan was to start at 4.30 in the morning, and that's what they recommend. Um, and it's gonna be pitch dark. And so they require that you wear um, a light on your helmet and a flashing light on the back. I'd never ridden like that before, so I thought it was gonna be pretty interesting. So this is a terrible picture because my light, my headlight kind of grounded out. That's me at 4.30 at my car, and uh, you pull up and they basically have you park on the side of this highway by this park. So, so all these cars are just like parallel parking on this highway you're gonna be riding on. And so I pull in and everybody's getting their bikes out. Everybody's starting, you just see a string of these red blinking lights. And there are um, 2,500 people doing this ride who signed up for it. Pretty much everybody starts between four and 5 a.m. So just down this highway, pitch dark, you just see red blinking, blinking, blinking lights. So I get my bike together and get talking to the crew next to me. And of course they ask, where are you from? And I say, I'm from Indiana. And they go, what are you doing out of here? <laughs> you came out of here just for this? So I got to talk to them, and they took off a few minutes before me, and I got going. And that is a crazy experience riding in the pitch dark. Um, that light shines super bright. I got a nice light, but it only illuminates like a five foot ring in front of you. So I'm cruising along, and I'm like, well, I can see the road fine. And uh, I kind of felt like I was going fast. So I, I just turned the headlight down to my uh, speedometer. I'm going 35 miles an hour, which is really fast on a bike. And I'm like, holy crap, I can only see you know, this little five foot ring. If anything is on the road in front of that five foot ring, I'm toast. I'm going to be just tumbling down the road. So I'm starting to get kind of nervous. And at the same time, I hear this kind of rumbling beside me. So I really slowly turn the, my headlight off to the side. And I'm right on the edge of the road, no guardrail, no shoulder. 
and it just drops straight down. And my light shines down probably 25 or 30 feet to this river that's just roaring over these boulders. And I'm right on the edge of the thing in the pitch dark. So needless to say, I scooted over and I rode the yellow lines and we're in the middle of that road until the sun came up. So it was really interesting. I, I wish I had practiced that in hindsight. So this is me, this is taken by the um, by the event organizers. They have a person, a cameraman, um, somewhere usually in the middle of each mountain pass taking pictures. So you see, you know, my, uh, my light on the top is turned off now. Um, I started with a jacket because it's like 40 degrees. It was way colder than they thought it was going to be. It was just unseasonably cold. So it, that's all wrapped up in the back. Uh, these are sleeves that can roll on and roll off so they can be a short sleeve shirt. You stick those in the back. And I have some pretty good spirits. Um, now that first mountain, I knew it was going to be about 10 miles. I thought it was going to average 10 miles an hour roughly. That's what my plan was. And when we started off, it was going just as planned. It was Fairly gradual. I mean, I was in a low gear, but I was keeping 10, 11 miles an hour, feeling pretty good. Well, about a halfway point, the thing goes, and it just turns super steep. Low, I go to click to another gear, and I'm already in my lowest gear, which is a horrible feeling on a bike. So I'm like, okay, that's all I got. So you're standing up, and I hear a guy tell his friend next to him, he's like, don't worry, this only goes on about four miles, and the last two level out again. I'm like, four miles? I looked down at my speed, my goal was 10 miles an hour, my speed was 4 miles an hour. And I'm telling you, when the only thing you can pay attention to and really look at this interesting on your bike is a speedometer that has an odometer, I can't tell you how slow a tenth of a mile goes by 4 miles an hour when you're staring at it and knowing you're going to go 10 miles up a mountain. So I started to get a little bit of a panic, but I remember my training, I'm like, don't let that get at you. You know, this is probably just a really steep section, the rest can be fine. And so I kind of beat that negative thought back. Got to the top of that one. Um, you're gonna get tired of these little selfies, but that's my, uh, at the top of Beach Mountain, I'm showing that I got one in. Um, and this is the rest stop at the top. Um, it's just in this huge meadow that's kind of on the top of this mountain range. And that's where you can refuel. You know, they got all kinds of stuff that's got calories and uh, drinks. You can fill up your drinks. Um, so I get, so at that point, <laughs> I'm a little nervous about how slow that mountain was, but I'm hopeful the other ones aren't that steep because that took me a lot longer to get up than I planned. And my brother was gonna be waiting for me on the bottom after we descend uh, this side. Um, so I was kind of excited about seeing him, so I bundled back up knowing it's gonna be cold. And we go flying down this hill, and I'm telling you, we are flying. We are going, I was going between 40 and 50 miles an hour the entire time down this 10 mile, is actually 12 miles down. And everybody says, you know, isn't it great that after the climbing the mountain, you get the reward of going faster down? And I'm telling you, the downhill stinks because you're so scared. If anything fails on your bike, you know, they're just going to find bones like that skeleton. <laughs> There's not going to be any skin left. And, uh, and it's rattling you like crazy. So it's noisy. It's rattling you. You're freezing cold. So cold, in fact, that um, I had to slow down to under 30 miles an hour a couple times when you get a shiver that was so big that it shaked the bike. <laughs> so you wanted to stay on the road. So you'd fight that back. But I got to the bottom, and that's me all on the left. My brother took this. And, uh, and so I told him, you know, hey, that first one was kind of steep. My times that I gave you may be a little off if they're all like that, but I'm feeling pretty good. And he's like, okay, well, I'll see you in eight hours. He was going to be at the 100 mile mark. And that kind of sunk in as I rode off in like eight hours. And I'll still have 30 miles to go. <laughs> And I already felt like I'd been on bike for a while. So we take off in this hill, and this is where it really started to turn for me. Um, this one was that steep that we had for about four miles on the first one, but the whole way. There was never a place that leveled off. And I got to about the halfway point, you know, okay, I was really tired. But then all of a sudden, um, I felt this catastrophe starting, which to a distance athlete is cramping. Kind of a nauseous feeling you get, and then your it's usually hamstrings first for me. Hamstrings started cramping. Well, I know from all the running and the marathons I've done, once that starts, you're at the tail end of what you're gonna be able to do that day. And it's 7 30 in the morning, and I'm on my second, I'm only halfway up my second of five mountains. So all the training about positive thinking, whew, gone. It immediately hits me that this is just not gonna happen. I'm not gonna be able to get this thing done. I was hundred percent sure my body was not gonna make it. Now, I knew I wasn't going to stop until I fell off the bike, but I just knew my body wasn't going to make it. And that negative feeling after all this training was horrible. I mean, horrible. So I, I stopped um, right after they took this picture. Look, you, you know, remember my first picture they took where I was like, yeah, this is great. Now you can see the grind in my face that, uh-oh, this is not going to be one of those days where, you know, a lot of good memories. And so I stopped right after this, and uh, 
this, I took this video, um, which because again, you're climbing the same mountain that you're going down, so there are people coming down who are behind me, and then I'm climbing, so you'll see some people going down here, and then you'll, um, and I'll point something out here. Hopefully this works here. Come on. If that doesn't work, we'll just have to imagine. There we go. So you can see the people flying down one side, and then uh, the people crawling out on the other side. And if you look, look down here to the left, way down this hill, way right there. So that part of the road was only about 250 meters from where I am taking this picture. So that gives you an appreciation for how steep it is. So those people went whizzing by, and way back there is where I met my brother. So we're about five miles into that climb, so all the way up this range. Um, and I'm just, like I said, mentally, I'm toast at this point. I'm thinking through how I'm going to tell my wife that I spent all this time training, you know, and I, I couldn't finish. But I made, it, you know, I made it up that second one, so I'm at the top. You can see I'm not looking too, uh, too excited about it. So I know now I'm going down the first mountain we climbed, so I'm heading back towards the car. So my thought was, get to the bottom and make a decision what I do. So fly down, it takes 10, 15 minutes to get to the bottom of these because you're just you know, flying. Actually, it took about 20 minutes. Um, so I get to the bottom and I'm nauseous, dizzy. Um, I was able to get some fluid in on the way down, so I felt like I was getting some of my hydration back. But I could turn right and go to my car, which is only about two miles, or I could turn left and start climbing the third mountain. And I started thinking, well, you know, if I fail halfway up the third, then all I gotta do is turn around and I can coast, that'll coast me back to my car, so what's the harm in going until I can get up this one? So I take off and it starts out, kind of like the first one did, fairly gradual, and so I'm starting to build confidence again. Uh, the cramping wasn't kicking back in, the nausea was kind of subsiding a little bit, so I thought, okay, well maybe I just had to work my way through this. And then I come up on the guys who were parked next to me, who were calling me Indiana guy, and they go, hey, it's Indiana guy. They're like, we didn't think we'd see you here. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? They're like, we didn't think you'd make it up the second one. And I was like, is it that hard for everybody? And they're like, yeah, it's a hard one. I was like, so are they all like this? Because this feels doable. And he said, well, he goes, it is for a while, but wait till you go by this little reservoir. He goes, it gets pretty steep. Well, sure enough, within about a mile of talking in, we hit the reservoir. And within about a mile of it going steep, cramping's back in. And this time, something I never had before, but my, uh, my abs, my stomach muscles started cramping. So you're bent over on a bike, pedaling you know, as hard as you can with your legs, and then your stomach cramps. So this is funny now, it wasn't funny at the time. So I'd jump off the bike, and the only way to get a cramp to stop is to stretch it. So I would go back like this to get the stomach to stop cramping. Well then, your butt muscles cramp. And you're, so I'm back here trying to get the abs to stop, then cramping back here. So I'm trying to figure out how you stand to get all the cramping, so you, you finally get to where you're fine, you get on the bike, and then your foot starts cramping. <laughs> So it was horrible, um, but maybe that's me climbing. So look at this, uh, look at the view in the back though. I didn't appreciate any of that when I was out there. Now I look at it, like, that was beautiful. So then here's a close up. So mom's nickname for me was Sir Sunshine because everybody says I always have a smile on my face, always a positive attitude. Mom, there's no <laughs> smile on that face. I mean, you can just see, just like in that second one, oh, this is just a grind. But I get to the top of it, and I remember, the thing I remember about the top of this one is I was ticked off because um, there were so many groups of people riding together who were just kind of, they were, they were tired, but they were laughing about it and saying, oh, can you believe that? And, and I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to socialize. I didn't want to laugh with anybody. And it was kind of making me mad because that was what I loved about the Colorado ride. I'm like, I'm not getting any of that. I'm just grinding on this thing. So I'm at the top of that one, deciding, now the fourth one, you go down the back side of it, away from my car. And I'm like, okay, how do I get back, you know, when my body collapses? Well, at that point, people started uh, uh, dropping out. I mean, almost a thousand people drop out of this thing who started. So people were starting to fail, other people were. And they had motorcycles, but they throw the bikes on the back of them. So I started to see a lot of those, and I thought, okay, well, they got motorcycles, and they got a rack. You know, I'll start down four, and then if I can't make it, I'll get a motorcycle right back to the car. So this is a video I got off of YouTube, um, and this is that fourth, the descent of the what the fourth pass that we're going to climb back up. And give it a, give it a second until he gets going. Actually, you can see um, here in the corner, if you can see it, he's got um, his miles per hour start kicking in. 
So he's going 30 right now, um, and he's not really at, an, at a descent yet. He's at 8,600 feet, so he's you know just shy of two miles high. And so you can see the road, you know, that's about how wide it is. Um, this particular stretch that he videoed has got a lot of pine trees, but a lot of it just had a straight down drop. Um, but you can see the riders coming up the hill, and, uh, and you can see as he gets, he's 34, 35. He was going a little slower because he wanted to video it, but we were going between 50, or 40 and 50 miles an hour down these. But look at that. There's the camera guy who takes the pictures. But look at that view. Isn't that beautiful? Huh. But you can, you can see you can see why the downhill. I mean, it's fun to watch on video, but you can see why you'd be nervous. I mean, anything go wrong, and you're uh, you're in trouble. So anyway, cruise cruise down that one. So this is me coming up four. All right. So I got to the bottom of it. The nice thing about the fourth one is it, it was the shortest one of all. It basically was only um, about eight miles, and so I was able to pop up to the top of that one. Here I am with four. So from that point, I had about 20 miles until I was going to meet my brother. I was feeling good that my body had held together and started to think that maybe this cramping wasn't going to be the end of me. It was just going to be a discomfort thing I had to deal with. And so we stopped for lunch um, and started heading towards my brother. Now, on this chart that I showed you before, right in here is a little hill that I never paid attention to when I was training, never thought about when I was heading out there. That sucker about dipped me in. It was against the wind. It was hot. I started cramping again, um, so I decided I was going to stop in my car, try to call my brother and tell him just to come back and get me. Well, I missed my car. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm riding, I'm on the top, I'm, I'm, start, I'm starting to go up this, uh, this pass here, and I realize I've already gone by my car, I've lost my opportunity to stop. But, well, let's give it a try. So I met my brother somewhere right in here. This stretch was brutal. Um, and I was so confused on the time that I didn't think I had enough time to get to the top of that mountain before the cut. But my brother, but it's just your mind, you know, not thinking clearly because of dehydration. So my brother's like, well, look what time it is. And he kind of went through the math. He's like, you could literally walk up the rest of the way and still make the cutoff time. So I took off. And I got um, within about two miles of the top. And um, if we found that the road where, where it had been burned, um, they hadn't had a chance to repave this road. So when, when I paint around here, look at how rough this road is. And this is our, we come up that stretch there. Um, but this road was so rough, and you've been on your bike 120 miles at that point. Look at that. And that was, that was what prevented you at the top of the last one. But then you also got this view, which is fantastic. So that's me. Love it, Mom. Sir Sunshine's back. See? Five done. And I, I gotta admit, when I got to the top, I'm not a crier. But I got at the top and I let out an uncontrolled whimper. That I didn't, and it was more surprise that my body had held together than I was able to get there than, than it was joy that I got, got to the top. So that's me with my five stickers, which you have to get to earn the finisher's jersey and a little pin you get. Um, this is the jersey that I'll get because I made all five uh, passes. They'll end up um, mailing that to me. I was hoping I was going to have it to be able to show you because that's all I thought about. I was like, I got to get that jersey. That's what everybody wants. <laughs> Then I thought this was interesting. Um, so 2,500 riders, and I was, you know, upset that I hadn't. I felt like I hadn't trained properly. But 2,500 riders um, up here, 2,000 of them are from California, literally right in the foothills of those mountains. So that's what they ride on all the time. That's why they're on top of that third hill, joking with each other and laughing because they do this all the time. Um, only 1,700 finished, so about 65% of those of us started to got all five <laughs> passes in, so that made me feel a little better. And then here's where it really hit home. This is a chart of my training. These are my hardest rides, the 100-mile rides. That one was 70. That's the elevation I, I climbed in the distance. This was the death ride. Yeah. So it would be like going out to run a marathon and doing eight miles for your longest run and then trying to run 26 miles in the marathon. And these all started at sea level. This one started a mile up in altitude. So the bottom, the bottom, the reason people kept saying you're from Indiana and you're doing this because you don't go do this from Indiana. <laughs> and so I, this is another one I'll never do, primarily because you can't train for it here. You can't put in the kind of miles and the kind of altitude that you do that you need to to be able to do that thing without crashing and burning. But I made it, and I survived, and it's one o'clock. So, sorry I'm going to rush through the last part of that a little bit, but I know you guys have a, a hard stop. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to stay around afterwards and, uh, and answer them for you. But I appreciate you letting me come down and share my little adventure.